not only flat. Okay, it's 3 o'clock. <laughs> you know, my speaker here would automatically alarm at 3 p.m. and it will recite the Divine Mercy Prayer. In any case, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to our session today. And I want to remind everyone that we're giving away our free ebook, The 10 Tips on Defending the Faith Clearly Without Being Preachy. You can download that at www.unboxingcatholicism.com forward slash starter guide. I'll talk to you more about this in a short while but since we are we want to start on time let us open the session with a prayer let's put ourselves in the presence of the almighty god and with with all humility and pious pride as children we declare our allegiance in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen lord we thank you for another opportunity that you have given us to learn from one another to celebrate the gift of faith that you have given us. And Father, we are praying for the Holy Spirit to be upon us so that we could understand how we can become witnesses of the risen Eucharistic Lord. Allow us, Lord, to have an open heart, open mind, and stir in our hearts the desire for souls and the passion for holiness that our students may see in us in our words, in our deeds, in our even in whatever we do in the class, Jesus, your son. And we ask also for the intercession of our dear mother who never fails nor never tires to inspire us in this work of evangelization. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saints Titus and Timothy, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. And once again, welcome to our seminar series. We are very happy to see all of you guys back in the Zoom room. And a lot of people here are also first timers. So I want to give yourselves a round of applause. Today, ladies and gentlemen, for those who are first timers, I'll just give a quick introduction. Anyway, you can watch the replay of my previous talks where I also shared, shared more about my conversion story. I used to be an anti-Catholic Protestant and I'm here to share with you how I became an evangelical Catholic and also more of my realizations and experiences as a teacher and defending the faith clearly without being preachy in the classroom. Okay, so as I've been mentioning, I'm not an expert. All I have here would be my experiences, realizations, learnings that I have had as a teacher, as a Catholic speaker, and a content creator. And I hope you can also share with us through the Zoom chat feature down below what you want to, to suggest, all right, to everyone in terms of learning. Okay, so uh, very nice. Okay, we have a lot of people still coming in. Let's pray that a lot of people would make it. And this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, we will be talking about one of the topics that I'm really, really passionate about, and this is Eucharistic piety. Strategies to develop love for the Mass among students. And I'm sure a lot of you here are very, very much experienced expert educators. So please, please, we are requesting you to please comment there in the Zoom chat your own personal tips on how we can help our students have a deeper Eucharistic piety. But let me begin by telling you where I was coming from as a Protestant before. And I have realized and I have seen, my dear friends, that there is a lot of confusion about the Eucharist. Do you agree to this? If you agree, please comment number one. Okay, first thing that a lot of people, when I was still a Protestant, I would think that the Eucharist is about cannibalism. Look at these memes that are swirling around online. The, the one on the left said, cannibalism, a like my God, medium rare, with a nice chanty. You know, it's very blasphemous, but a lot of people poke fun of the Eucharist because a lot of people also do not understand what the Eucharist is. And dare I say that even with the, with, within Catholic circles, there are Catholic teachers, unfortunately, who are not so clear about the beliefs of the church on the Eucharist, and we don't want to judge. Okay, we know that we are all on different levels of formation. That's why St. John Paul II, Pope Francis, Pope Benedict have been encouraging us to live the law of graduality. Unti-unti. 
in Filipino. We have to unbox the faith piece by piece so that people can understand it and people can own it. All right? And here, on the right side, you see uh, an accusation that has been there for 2,000 years already, that we are all cannibals. Have you heard of this, that Catholics are cannibals? If so, can you please comment letter C in the chat box? If you've heard that Catholics are cannibals, according to many, many non-Christians or Protestants. You see, a lot of people are, can relate to this one. And here you see Christians are cannibals, eats the flesh and drinks the blood of their Lord and Savior on every Sunday. Actually, this is inaccurate. Why? Because we have our masses every single day. But still, it's blasphemous. But many people are confused about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. In fact, when I was a Protestant, I was a huge fan of all of these uh, gospel tracks. What you're seeing on the screen, dear friends, is a Jack T. Chick, C-H-I-C-K gospel track. This is more common in the U.S., but the content is also very much common among fundamental Protestants here in the Philippines. So when you receive these tracks, these are the main messages. Number one, Catholics kill Jesus again and again in the Holy Mass. If you have heard of this accusation, comment number one. All right, the second is, the Eucharist is like a magic trick. The church is saying that there is a magic that's happening. Kasi nga naman, no? when, 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 before, when, did you know that the word hocus pocus that we associate with magic actually came from the consecration prayer in Latin, in hoc, something, something. no. So now when people say that the Eucharist is becoming Jesus, real Jesus, it's like magic. If you've heard of this, comment number two. Okay? So of course, these are not foreign accusations. Number three, the Eucharist was a lie that was invented by the Catholic Church in the Dark Ages so that they can manipulate the, the people so that they can collect more tithes and so that the church can earn more money. If you have heard of this, comment number three. These were my beliefs as a Protestant before, my dear friend. Unfortunately, as proven by our Zoom chat, these are very, very common misconceptions about the greatest teaching of our church. In fact, the worst of all that I've heard and, you know, with all penance and with all humility, I would have to admit the worst of all the things that I have taught people before is that the Eucharist is a satanic worship ritual. If you have heard of this, comment number five. And this is so unfortunate. The church teaches us, dear Catholic teachers, that this is the summit and source of our faith. And yet we have all of these caricatures and wrong ideas about the Eucharist and it is our mission to correct them. Let me tell you this now, my friends, and I'm sure a lot of you will agree to this. A lot of people have already lost faith in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. In fact, in the U.S., this is what the Pew Research has been saying, that 69% of Amer Americans believe that the bread and wine are just symbols. It's nothing but just a piece of bread. And only a ma minority of people, 28%, know the church's teaching on transubstantiation. And of this, there are still doubts. You know, it's a stark difference of a, a survey that was released in the Philippines recently, and it has made the headlines that says, majority of Filipino Catholics believes Holy Eucharist is actual body and blood of Christ. Okay? So, uh, this is a stark contrast to what we are seeing in the United States. Now, let me ask you, what do you think of this slide? If you agree that most of your students and most of your colleagues and you yourself believe that Jesus is in the Eucharist, really in the Eucharist, not just a symbol, please comment real. Now, you can be honest if until this point you are thinking that Jesus is just symbolic there. There's no judgment here. We're not here to condemn anyone. You can comment symbol. Okay, so let's see. Real symbol, okay. We have many people here. Okay, no problem. No problem. We see that we, we can be honest. This is a safe space. We are not here to judge anyone. Okay, very nice. Thank you so much for your honesty, ladies and gentlemen. And now let's reflect on this. No, This is my take. 
Okay, this is my take on the survey. I'm not saying that the survey is wrong. I don't have any authority or credibility to, to say that I'm not a researcher. But this is my take, dear Catholic friends. If Filipinos know well the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, they won't even think of leaving the church. If, you know, if they know that Jesus really present in the sacrament, whatever happens, they will stay as Catholics because they know that there is a treasure in the tabernacle. Now, let's ask ourselves, how many people do we know have left the church to join a more lively, dynamic, tightly knit Protestant community? In Filipino, mas masaya, mas buhay, mas aktibo. No, if you can just comment a rough estimate of how many relatives and friends you know who are leaving the church because they appreciate the Bible study in the other group better. Because in the other a Protestant sect, they, they feel more emotional in the worship services. In the other places of Christian worship, they see the Bible, they hear the Bible more and more. No, a lot. We, ha we know a lot of people. Again, I was one of them. And then how many Catholics who are former Catholics have said that their personal relationship with Jesus has deepened when they left the church? Can you comment a rough estimate of how many people you know who told you, you know, I left the church and I had a more personal relationship with Jesus. In fact, that's what I was fighting for. I was telling people before, you know, I became a Protestant because in the born-again church, I have a more personal relationship with Jesus. But you know, my dear friends, we have the most personal relationship with our Lord because of the sacrament of the Eucharist. Okay, sabi ni Loretta, many of my cousins are converters from Catholics to born-again Christians. Yes, Miss Loretta, this is the sad reality of all the peoples of the world, especially here in the Philippines. To the point that I ask one of my friends in CBCP because I help out in projects in, in the Catholic Bishops' Conference, I ask, what are we doing to help people discover the real presence in the Eucharist? And, and the answer that I got was, you know, a lot of people know what to believe in. But, you know, because I was a former Protestant, I know that there is a problem. In the, it, there is a crisis in catechesis because for me, I was not a Catholic because I chose to be one or because I knew my faith very well. I was a Catholic because I just happened to be born as one. And that was a very weak reason, at least for me. And as I've mentioned yesterday, dear friends, we have a great crisis in catechesis. Can we call it crisis? But, you know, I don't want to be an alarmist. For all of our seminars, we want you guys to have one thing to remember, that there is hope. Now, after commenting crisis, comment hope. Okay, because there is hope. You, the one attending this series of seminars, we are all the hope of the church. We are Christ's hope in our midst today. No, so... There, I would uh, like to offer you three possible reasons. I'm not saying that these are all the reasons why people leave the church. Okay, And these are all in relation to the Eucharist. Number one, as I've been mentioning, many are highly sacramentalized but insufficiently evangelized. Agree or agree? Okay, What is happening here? We have a lack of formation in the families. We have a lack of formation in the parishes. Okay, we're not blaming parents. We're not blaming priests. When we think of all of these things, my friends, my invitation is not to blame anyone in your parish. Not to blame the parish pastor or council, but to take a look at ourselves. What am I doing? My gosh, there are a lot of things that are happening in the church, but what is my contribution? So parents are not able to form their children. That's why they send the, the children to Catholic schools thinking that the Catholic schools is a factory of saints. It should be, right? But <laughs> parang what happens is they just depend on the teachers. Kayo na bala, it's up to you. But that's not how it goes, as we know, as we heard from Mr. Rento, you know. So there is a lack of formation in the parishes. Even Bishop Sok Villegas agrees to it that boring sermons are unfair to God and to the people. And to tell you, that's my problem also. When I was, when I was very young, that's why I left the church. I never really didn't get to the deeper sense of biblical readings before. I think Burns is experiencing a little bit of a technical disconnection. Um, let's wait a bit and let's pray for him. Okay, uh, let me see. He's back here. Um, 
sorry about this uh, we're in the philippines so this is something <laughs> almost uh, expected and part of uh, reality i have to be on the lookout for his uh, return because i will have to make sure i get to make him uh, co-host right away uh, for a while huh? mm -hmm. yeah uh, this is the reason, okay, he's back already. This is the reason why we are recording the session so that uh, for those of you who may also encounter um, technical difficulties in your Wi-Fi connection, you can actually access the recording. Okay, welcome back, Burns. Not yet. <laughs> Okay, uh, he's back for a while. Uh, we'll make him co-host. Okay, Burns, are you back? Not yet. <laughs> we can, uh, yes, we can go to St. Joseph, the terror of demons to uh, <laughs> um, help Burns get back in the Zoom room. Um, meanwhile, let me see. I'm going to type in the chat box the um, let me see the links that you need to know for the certificates as well as the um, uh, how do you call this the materials. The recording of this uh, session can be accessed in our Facebook group page. Okay. Uh, so I've, I've uh, put there, let me see, Burns is here. Um, for a while, Burns. Are you using a different uh, connection now? Okay. Burns, are you in? Burns, we can't hear you yet. Go ahead, Burns. You're already co-host. Please unmute yourself. All right. I'm really sorry. I don't know what's happening, but this is really my recurring experience. Whenever I talk about the Eucharist, something happens with the with the device. I hope you can bear with us and still stay on. Okay, dear friends. So as I have mentioning, as I've mentioned, there is a crisis in catechesis because we lack faithful lay witnesses, and that's me, and that is you. Okay, and then the second is, of course, we all know that there, is, there are bad examples that, and scandals that we see in the church today. For example, the sexual abuse scandal. All of us know about that. And for these reasons, before I hated the church because I thought it was irrelevant. I thought it was backward. I thought it was abusive. And I thought it was corrupt. Okay, so all of this and most of all, I thought that the church was unbiblical. And number three, the strong reason that I think why people lose their belief in the Eucharist and leave the church because of very, very strong anti-Catholic evangelical influences. Just look at people flocking to different Protestant services because they're fun, right? And we have to do something about this. We really have to bring back the Eucharist to the center of our faith. That's why these three things, we have to take note of them. If you can take a screenshot, that would be helpful. So that all of us no, would, would know what we can do as a church for us to be able to resolve all of these problems. Now, let us reflect on this. This session, dear friends, I hope we could finish earlier to allow room for questions. Please type down your questions and we'll see if we can answer them. Let us reflect on these questions. Okay, Number one, do our students go to Mass with reverence? 
And we see some many times students when they go to mass, they chat with each other, they text, they do a lot of things. What are what do our students think of the Eucharist? Is it just a wa wafer, a piece of bread, a symbol, or really the body, blood, and soul of our Lord? Do my students eat meals with their friends and families? You know, uh, it, it was so hard for me to teach about the importance of the Eucharistic meal, telling them that, you know, dear students, the Eucharist is a meal. Don't you know that when, when we eat the Eucharist, Jesus is declaring to the world that he is our friend because in the Jewish tradition, eating meals together means communion, eating meals together, being one with everyone. And then one of my students raised his hand, sir, I don't eat lunch or dinner with my family. We eat in our own rooms. That's so sad. So, I mean, it's so hard no, to, to, to use these analogies if our students don't experience this. So if they don't, what are we doing? You know, in the PARIF system, I mentioned yesterday that we have a mentoring system. And part of the mentoring is that religion teachers also chat with the parents regularly, one-on-one, -on -one, so that whatever we study in the classroom, it can be reinforced at home. So if that is something that you can set up in your own schools, we encourage you to explore that possibility. And let us also reflect on this. Do I, as a religion teacher, know and believe in the church's teaching on the Eucharist? So many of you humbly accepted that you are having doubts about the real presence. And I understand that. Okay. Second, how often do I want to desire to receive the Lord sacramentally in the Holy Mass or spiritually through spiritual communion? So these are reflection questions that we should uh, ask ourselves, including myself and Mr. Rentoy. Do I live a Eucharistic life? So, remember in my story, as a former Protestant, Roque was the one who told me, Burns, you're missing a lot and you're missing the Eucharist. And it took years for me to really understand what the heck the Eucharist meant. No? And before, when I was a Protestant, I used to go to the Liturgy of the Word. Remember, the Mass has two parts, no? the Liturgy of the Word and then the Liturgy of the Eucharist. When I, went to, when I was still a Protestant, I got curious. Okay, fine, I would go to Mass, but I will not go to the Liturgy of the Eucharist because I thought, that was cannibalism. I thought that was murdering Jesus, but I wanted to hear the priest preaching. And in UANP, even though the masses are just, even the homily would just be five to ten minutes, it was always jam-packed with doctrine. And that really made me think. And you know, when I was already about to convert to Catholicism, remember the story of my high school friend who was a mentor to me? I told him, sir, you got to save me because I think God is calling me back to Rome. You know, the reply of my friend, he told me, you know, just bring me gifts from Rome. Bring pasalubong. I told him, no, sir, I don't think I am going to Rome for a vacation. I think God is calling me to become a Catholic again. And then he told me, Burns, why would you want to be a Catholic again? Do you want to be a cannibal? And that's when the, I really thought through about it. And that's when I remembered what my, men, my other mentor told me, Roque, said what he said, you are missing a lot because you are missing the Eucharist. Now, let me ask you this question. Are we missing out on the Eucharist? Only we ourselves can answer that. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't need to go deeper into this, but we all know that the Eucharist is the sort and source and summit of our Christian life. That's what the Second Vatican Council, that's what the Catechism tells us. Let's let that sink in. Sometimes when we keep on repeating words of our faith, it becomes so routinary and familiar that it doesn't have impact anymore. But you know, the first time I heard this, I was like, what? The Eucharist is the source and the summit, meaning the beginning and the end. If there's no Eucharist, there's no Catholicism. Everything falls apart. That's how important this doctrine is. That's why we want to encourage everyone to, to really know more about this. And so there I was when I heard this as a Protestant who was anti-Catholic, I told the Lord, Lord, you wanted me to become a pastor. I better know the truth. Lord, I told him, I need to know if Catholics are lying about their Eucharist. Help me. And of course, where was the first stop that I, I went to? John chapter 6. Just very quickly, let's just go over this as I, because some people here in the chat said that uh, they believe that the Eucharist is symbolic and Again, we understand that, no? And we don't pass, pass on judgment to anyone here. But we want to be able to know, saan ba nang gagaling itong tinuturo ng simbahan na talagang si Kristo ay nasa Eucharistia? No? And then after this, we will unbox the strategies, the, the very, very practical strategies on how we can help our students realize this. Now, I don't know what's happening. My <laughs> slides are not working. Okay, now, John chapter 6, the context is here. Please read it on your own after the talk. Meditate on it. 
But here, in John chapter 6, we see Jesus just fed 5,000 men with five loaves of bread and two fishes. And Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and gave the bread. You know, the Greek word for giving thanks is eucharistian, thanksgiving. That's really what the Eucharist means. And then, after feeding the 5,000, after people saw the signs Jesus performed, they began to say, Uy, surely this is the prophet, the prophet whom we are waiting for. However, they asked Jesus for a proof. Isn't it that we are like that, dear friends? No, When we hear of a claim, a very startling claim, we ask for a proof, show proof, show signs. And that's exactly what they did. They asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you, Jesus? What will you do? And this is interesting. Do you remember that when we were younger, or perhaps your students, have you heard your students uh, play the game, wala kayo sa lolo ko? Or can you top that? Okay. In Filipino, wala kayo sa lolo ko. Meron siyang malaking mansion. And then another, another person will say, wala kayo sa lolo ko. He has a huge car. Or in English, you are nothing against my grandfather. He has a mansion. And then the other, another kid would say, oh, my, my grandfather is better because he had 10 mansions. You know, young people would play this game and sometimes it's entertaining when we hear them. And my friends, whenever I explain this John 6 to my students, that's the analogy that I use. The people were telling Jesus, Sige nga, Jesus, you know, Jesus, our fathers gave us manna, the bread coming from heaven. He gave us that. What are you go going to do to help us believe in you? All right? So Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread. For the bread of God is the bread, okay, that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And now here we see, okay, if you overhear teachers talking about the latest uh, Avon products that they got, have you heard of that? No, Teachers uh, talk about the latest cosmetics, the latest uh, Lazada or Shopee haul that they had. And then when you saw that it's beautiful, you would ask, where did you get that? I want to get too. That's exactly the reaction of the people. Jesus was telling them that there is a bread that came down from heaven and it is something that will give life to the world. And the natural reaction was, Lord, Give us that bread. Pahingi naman in Filipino. Please give us that. And Jesus said something very shocking. I am that bread. Ako yun. I am the bread. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will not be, will ever be thirsty. Okay? At this point, okay, yung mga marites, okay, the marites of the Jews, meaning the, the gossipers of the Jewish people, they began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread of life. I, I am the bread that came from heaven. Isn't he Jesus, the carpenter, the son of Mary and Joseph? How can he now say that I am the bread of life, that he came from heaven? You see, they were baffled. If you were in the position of the Jewish people, dear religion teachers, would you have understood also what Jesus meant initially? My answer is no. What's your answer? If I was there, and for a moment, I want all of us in this Zoom room, 400 plus of us, to imagine Jesus is talking to us in front of us, okay? And then when we hear that, wow. And then you know what's funny? When I, whenever I go to this lecture, I tell my students, boys, because they're all boys, what if I tell you, I am Mr. Kasi, I am the bread from heaven, you have to eat me. What will be your reaction? My students said, ew, sir, that's so gross. And that's exactly what happened here in the Bible, dear friends. And Jesus said, very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna and they're dead. But here is the bread that comes down. Where is this bread? He said, this bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And that's when the rubber hits the road. That's when the Jewish people got even more confused. And that's when modern Catholics can, ev can get more confused. Then the Jews began to argue. Can we replace this? Then modern Catholics of January 2022 began to argue sharply among themselves, how can Jesus give us his flesh to eat? Okay? And what happened next? Jesus said, it's just a symbol, guys, you misunderstood me. No, 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 no. That's not what Jesus said. In John 6, 52, he said, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drinks his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. Okay? For my flesh, and this is very, very visual, 
For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Now, here's what's interesting here, my dear friends. All right? What is interesting here is the language that the holy writers of the gospel wrote. You can take a screenshot of this so you can use this in your explanation to your students. In John chapter 6, in the first part, part of John 6, where Jesus was making references to eating, he was using the word phago in Greek, an all-encompassing term which means to eat. But then, when he referred to himself eating his body and blood, he would use the word trogon. Can we comment that in the, in the chat box? Trogon. Okay? Trogon. What does that mean? Nguyain. To gnaw. To gnaw and, and chew it like meat. To really tear it apart in our mouths. That's the literal meaning of knowing. And the people knew what Jesus meant. That's why they reacted so violently. And John 6.60 6, On hearing this, many of his disciples said, This is hard teaching. Who can accept it? Ang hirap niyan. And then aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, okay, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man, etc., etc.? And then look at the last part. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Now let's ask ourselves, we religion teachers, are we going to turn back? And are we going to stop following Jesus just because we didn't understand? Now here's the funny thing. I would always, this is how I teach it. Now, I'm sharing this with you while doing it with you. I would always ask the students to close their eyes while we are studying John chapter 6 and imagine what's happening. Imagine they are there hearing the words of Jesus. And I told them, let's go to the next verse. Jesus, look at his disciples. Imagine now a K-drama, a Korean drama, kind of cinematography. Jesus was preaching, you know, imagine before you, most people started living and then Jesus in a slow motion Look at the disciples and the apostles, and he asked them, Will you also leave? Imagine you're there. Imagine, the, tell your students, imagine you're there, dear students. You would, would you want to also leave? Did Simon Peter say, No, Lord, we know that in the catechism it's called transubstantiation. We understood perfectly what you meant that the species of the body and the blood will be. No, 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 no. That's not, not what that's not what St. Peter said. What St. Peter was saying. In John chapter 6, verse 69 is this. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Translation, Lord, we did not understand what you told us. How can we eat your flesh and drink your blood? But Lord, because you were able to raise Lazarus from the dead, because you were able to speak the world into existence. Lord, because you can heal people who are sick just by telling them, be healed. Talitakum. We don't know where to go, Lord. But your words have power. When you say, be healed, the person is healed. When you said, let there be light, they are healed. Now when you say, this is your body, we believe that it is your body. Because your word, your word creates reality. Can we comment that the words of Jesus create reality? That's what St. Peter was saying, he didn't understood. Hindi niya alam yung transubstantiation. He didn't have the catechism. But he had faith. Can we comment that faith? Perhaps right now, dear Catholic teachers, you are doubting. Is Jesus really there in that piece of bread in the host? I doubt, Lord. Help me. It's okay. Because that's what happened to the apostles. And yet, even they doubted, they believed, and they stayed. You know what happened? Exactly one year. Can you comment, guys, one year? And this is really where my students would see, wow, it's, it's amazing how this thing happened. Exactly one year, something happened that opened the eyes of the apostles. Can you ask me what? Can you type what? Okay, so you can do that, no? When you go give your online classes, tell your students to keep chatting in the comment section. On the night he was betrayed, before he went, he entered willingly into his passion, he took bread, giving thanks Eucharistine, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take this, all of you, and eat of it. This looks like my body. This is a symbol of my body. This, is that what he said? No, no, no. He said, this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper has ended, he took the chalice and once more giving you thanks, 
gave the chalice to his apostles and to his disciples and said, take this all of you and drink from it. For this is the blood of my new and everlasting covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Exactly one year. And finally, the, the, the eyes of the apostles were opened. This is how we eat him. This is how we drink him. Do this in remembrance of him. That is the Eucharist, my dear friends. So that's just a quick overview. We can, you know, spend all of our week talking about the Eucharist. And here's, here comes St. Paul in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, telling the people that that is indeed the body of our Lord. That is indeed the blood of our Lord. And he says in 1 Corinthians, we are sinning against Jesus if we do not, if we do not see, if we do not discern that he is there in the Eucharist. Not take a screenshot of this and try to meditate on this. And so, my dear friends, these things, along with the witness of the early church, we were told as Protestants that this Eucharist is just an invention of the Catholic Church in the year 300 so that the church can collect more money. That was the accusation. But here comes my friend Ignatius of Antioch, si Lolo Ignacio. Okay? He wrote this in 110 AD when the church was very young. He said that the Eucharist is really the flesh and blood of our Lord. And also Justin Martyr, who wrote this first apology in 150 AD, he also said, this is really the body and blood of the Lord. So there's no truth that the teaching that it's really the body of the Lord is a new one. It has been there when Christianity began, and it will be there until the end of time. And now, my dear friends, let me continue with my story. As a, as a Protestant back then, I was learning all of these things, and I was so scared. But I was also very hungry and thirsty. And so one time, I decided to go to the chapel of the Eucharistic Lord of all places. I actually entered that chapel without knowing that that's the name of the chapel. I entered Megamall's chapel with this very, very providential name. I attended Mass. And I was thinking, Lord, if you are there in the Eucharist, show yourself to me. I didn't know what to expect. But, you know, when the priest started doing the prayer of consecration, as a Protestant, we were immersed in the Bible. All of these Bible verses came rushing in. All of the writings of the church fathers came rushing in. And when the priest said, this is my body, this is my blood, I fell on my knees and I broke down, recognizing once and for all that this is the Lord that I've, I've been wanting to serve. But this is also the Lord that I have that I have attacked not knowing that he is there in the Eucharist. And so after that, I just, you know, being the emotional me, I, I wanted to receive the Lord, but I, I was not yet a Catholic. This episode happened before my episode with Mary, that, the one I shared with you yesterday. And, you know, I spent the time after that just, you know, crying before the adoration. And, you know, a friend suddenly approached me and he asked me, Burns, why are you here? And I told him, I saw him. Finally, I, I realize that he is here. Here's my Lord and my God giving himself to me. And then he started crying and asked me, Burns, do you know I prayed for you specifically in this Mass? You know, again, where there is grace, there is conversion. I repeat that. Where there is grace, there is conversion. And whenever I receive the Eucharist from that point on, even until now, it still moves me. And I would always ask myself, before I receive the host, who am I? Can we ask ourselves that? Who are we? Weak sinners, unrepentant believers, and yet the Lord gives His entire body, blood, soul, and divinity to ourselves. Who are we? Who am I? And now, I want to, to invite you to, to think about this. We Catholic teachers, you and me, are called by God today to be witnesses of His presence, modern apostles of the Eucharist. That's why there is a need for us to learn strategies on how we can teach this better. And now, this is the practical part. And I abbreviated it with S-T-E-M or STEM. Okay, STEM, can you type that? S-T-E-M. The first is, how do we teach Eucharistic piety? How do we deepen the faith of our boys and girls? Stories. We go back to what I said in the first day of talk, stories. T stands for teaching. E stands for experiences. And M starts, stands for 
modeling. Can we take a screenshot and comment STEM? Very good. I like the energy of our religion teachers in the Zoom room today. So let's unbox them one by one very quickly. Stories. Let's start with stories. Now, what kind of stories, Mr. Kaasi, can we share with our students to deepen their Eucharistic piety? First is, how the saints loved the Eucharist and died for him. There are a lot of stories of this. Second, stories of Eucharistic miracles. If you are doubting, if you have doubts about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, you are not alone. In the 2,000-year history of the church, there are priests, not just religion teachers, who doubted the presence of the Lord in the sacrament. And Eucharistic miracles happen for them to be consoled and to, for them to be confirmed that this is really true. And I'll show you some videos later. Now, the next story is stories, <coughs> I'm sorry, stories of conversion. And consolation, some people, they were so sad and they were so depressed, but when they stared at the Eucharist, you know, when they were sitting in front of the Blessed Sacrament, they sensed a very different kind of peace. You know, let me tell you of a very, very good story I heard somewhere, I forgot where. During the time when Christianity was very new, in the Philippines, okay, I'm, sure, I'm not sure if it's in the Philippines, but I, I think it's in the Philippines. There was a Christian family who had a pagan neighbor. Okay, the, pag, the, the Christian family opted to have a blessed sacrament in their home. I don't know how possible that was. No? Paano na payagan? And then there was the blessed sacrament there. And the, the, the owner of the house had to leave somewhere, no? how to go somewhere. And then they wanted the blessed Eucharist not to be alone. Okay, because it's a per it seems like it's a perpetual adoration kind of thing. And they cannot find anyone in the house to be with the, with the Lord. So instead, they knocked on the neighbor's door. Then there they found a pagan uh, person, a pagan woman, and then requested, can you guard something for me? Okay, I just need to go and I just need to, to do something in the bayan or in the town. The pagan, being kind, agreed to it. And then she sat down in front of the Blessed Sacrament, just there just staring at the lord and then after many hours napatagal no it, it took a while for for the catholic to come back and then he's he the catholic asked the woman i'm so sorry it took so long the pagan said no it's okay i've never been at peace in my life until now so these are very consoling stories on the eucharist and there are a lot you can find online and you know the most powerful my dear friends is your personal testimony if you're a teacher who once doubted the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist and you realize how true is that, that is your story. That is your conversion story. And that's the most powerful story that your students can hear. If, for example, if, if Miss, Mrs. Julie An Andosulit will tell her students about this, if Malu, Virginia, Miss Lydia, and you know all of you guys, Beatrice Perea, will just start say, telling their students, how the Eucharist have touched them, that is the most powerful kind of story. Stories first. Now, speaking of stories, uh, let's watch this short video on Eucharistic miracles. Okay? So, let me share my screen. There are a lot of, there are a lot of Eucharistic miracles that we can actually learn from. And there are an abundance of resources online that we could give our students. For example, you can go to the website of Blessed Carlo Acutis at carloacutis.com where Carlo himself designed a website that would document all the Eucharistic miracles. And I invite you to read about this, the miracles of Lanciano. All of these were where there was a priest who was doubting if Jesus was really there and in the consecration, the the, the host became real flesh and there was blood dripping. All of these are well documented. And before the church declared these Eucharistic miracles, even scientists had to analyze the situation. So there are a lot of stories, my dear friends. The next is teachings. For us to really understand and be able to pass on the faith, especially in the Eucharist, it's important that we know the teachings. So what can I teach? Show the Eucharist from our scripture and tradition, like what I told you earlier. I showed you John chapter 6, Corinthians, and then how the early church really studied the Eucharist and really believed in the Eucharist. 
You can share realizations of converts on the reality of his presence when you go to videos of Scott Han and all of other converts. Even my, my conversion story on YouTube, you can use that because I talked there about the Eucharist. You study the writings of the church fathers and the saints, and it is anonymous. Every saint, every church father have believed in the real presence of the Eucharist. And let's use the new media. There are a lot of studies, online Bible studies and online resources available. For example, okay, if you're asking, where do I get materials for teaching? Here are the materials and they're all free. Go to Unboxing Catholicism YouTube channel. I had a lot of videos teaching more extensively on the Eucharist. There are several episodes on the Eucharist. Okay, so you just go to YouTube and search Unboxing Catholicism or my name plus the word Eucharist or communion. You'll see all of those. And then you can go to unboxingcatholicism.com. We have some articles on the Eucharist. For example, si Cristo ba ay tunay na nasa Eucharistia? It's a Tagalog article. If you are interested in Tagalog, there are also English articles on my website. You can also listen to my Spotify podcast, which is in mostly English for now, but it will slowly be in Tagalog. The first episodes there, I unbox there the Eucharist in so many, I think two or three episodes. You can try that and see if you can use that for your, for your task. Go to opusday.org. It's a very, very beautiful source of Catholic doctrine. When you go to opusday.org, click or hover over the Christian Life button and you will see their inspiration for your prayer, resources that you can use in school, summaries of Catholic teaching, articles, videos, ebooks, etc. Everything you need as a religion teacher, it's there online. Also in our Facebook group, you will have a lot of resources. Go to catholic.com which is very, very trustworthy when it comes to explaining the faith. You know, there are other tips that I wanted to share with you. Just remember, my dear Catholic friends, that we cannot give what we do not have. We have to be able to embrace the Eucharist first by continuously deepening our knowledge and devotion. It's not just head. It should have a heart. No, uh, We know a lot about the Eucharist, but we don't adore the Eucharist. So I'm inviting you this is not an imposition, but a pro proposition, a proposal to deepen also our knowledge and devotion and always be excited. You know, when you are excited to talk to your students about the Eucharist, they will wonder, why is my teacher so excited about this? What is this? Okay, so that's, that's very, very interesting. No, we, we, Our excitement can help our students understand that. And if you want more formation, take a screenshot of this. No, there, uh, Father Kayo gives doctrine classes every second Thursday, and there are recollections and meditations. Just go to www.facebook.com forward slash yapi timeout. These are formation activities you can attend online to deepen your doctrinal knowledge. And for the men, okay, you can be my classmate. I attend basic classes of theology Mondays at 6 p.m. And I also have weekly advanced theology classes at 6.15 p.m. Just email me if you, as a male teacher, you would want to be part of this. Also, just take a screenshot and let me know your thoughts. Now, next is experiences. Nothing beats creating a conducive, holistic, exciting, memorable, fun learning experience for our students. Paano? How? Eucharistic processions. Perhaps after this pandemic or when face-to-face -face classes resume, even in your parishes, we request you, we we urge you to have Eucharistic processions. This is also an opportunity to bond with your students. Look at this. In UANP, students and teachers were bonded in preparing for the carpet where the Blessed Sacrament will pass through. It, it, of course, we all know that the Pope did a Eucharistic benediction. Perhaps when the Pope did it, that's the first time. Many young people or many Catholics have seen a benediction. Let's make it more regular in our schools. First Friday Holy Mass. This is something that we are also... Uh, thing we are doing in Parep and it's really giving us a lot of conversions and we hope you can also do this. Holy hour or Eucharistic adoration, especially now, our students do not know silence anymore or even perhaps even teachers need silence. Perhaps teachers need to know how to pray before the Blessed Sacrament. Perhaps teachers need to know how to meditate. That's why I'm inviting you to the meditation on Friday at 5.30 p.m. No? Of course, if you are a school administrator, if you are a chaplain, it really, really helps. This is tried, proven, and tested in all the parish schools. When the Eucharist is celebrated reverently, the priest is very reverent in his celebration. It causes a lot of conversions. Very careful in holding the host, even maintaining the, the digital 
canon, no? I don't, or I, I don't know how you call that, but the priest retaining his hands like this, even in the new rite of the Mass. The priest genuflecting carefully, adoring the Blessed Sacrament, putting silent time, okay? You may, after the homily or after receiving the host, there's thanksgiving. The students are encouraged to do frequent spiritual communions. It can cause a lot of conversion. In fact, we have had students who would remember their teachers in grade one. And when we ask them, what do you remember from your grade one religion teacher? Spiritual communion. That is very beautiful. Another thing that we could explore is let's help our students learn to love the sacrament of confession. Because without confession, there is no Eucharist. St. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11 that we have to be worthy to receive our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Let's love confession. We, religion teachers, if we can go to weekly confession, tell our priest and, and ask him, Father, I cannot believe that the Eucharist is more than a symbol. I don't know what to do. Help me, Father. I need, to, I need to help myself first so that I can help my students. Help us. And also ask, ask grace so, so that our confession will also lead our students to conversion. I'll repeat that. May our confession, Lord, lead our students to conversion. Okay, and then uh, last but not the least, modeling. Okay, I think Mr. Rentoy has been also saying this, and this is really proven to work in Paref if we model what we teach, if we walk the talk. So how can we be Eucharistic models? Eat and chat with our students whenever possible. Why? Because that is the Eucharistic meal. The Lord wants to eat a meal with us, to spend time with us, because by eating a meal without hurrying, you know, ngayon, in our time, we hurry, we, we are very quick in our lunch, dinners, that having a meal with the family has lost its meaning. Let's restore that in the Eucharist. And be their mentor. Listen with an intent to understand. They have a struggle. Okay? They have a lot of unanswered questions. Let's listen. Because that's what the Eucharist is also all about. Presence. Let's show them how we love our Lord in the Eucharist. Let's genuflect if it's needed. Of course, it's always needed when we see the Blessed Sacrament. If it's exposed, we do double genuflection. No? And then we take a pause. We visit the Blessed Sacrament after lunch. These are very, very good practices. Offer the names of your students. No? Tell our Lord, Lord, I'm offering this confession for the conversion of my students. And pray. Let's pray for our students whenever we receive Jesus in the Eucharist. Tell our Lord, Lord, I want to receive you with the purity, humility, and devotion with which your most holy mother receive you with the spirit and fervor of the saints for the sake of my students who do not know you, for the sake of my students who had a lot of questions, for the sake of my students who are struggling, Lord, help me receive you so that they can also receive you. We have to lead the way, dear Catholic teachers. We have to be the one to receive Jesus more often so that through us, we can be the presence of the Eucharist in the midst of our students. St. John Paul II said something very beautiful and yet so hard to understand in first reading. In Ecclesia de Eucharistia, he said, the Eucharist is the, the source and summit of all evangelization. Let's translate this. The Eucharist, dear teachers, is the source and summit of all our curriculum. I will repeat that. The Eucharist is the source and summit of our religion curriculum. Since its goal is not the memorization of doctrine, since its goal is not to cover the entire lesson plan, but to have communion of mankind with Christ and in Him, with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Let's go back to what Jesus said in the Last Supper. He said, do this in memory of me. Many times we think that it's the priest who should be doing this in memory of him. But as religion teachers, we are being called not to become priests, but to be priestly souls, bringing our students closer to our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. When the, now when we go to Mass, when we attend it, and when you hear the word, do this in memory of me, think and imagine that the Lord is, that you are there in the, the Last Supper, because that's what happens in the Mass. We are there in, the, in front of our Lord. And the Lord is telling us, art, do this in memory of me. Teach the boys, teach the girls about me. Mon, do this in memory of me. Christian, do this in memory of me. Jester, sister, Grelin, do this in memory of me. 
teach the boys that I am truly present, that here I am, the God who created the heavens and the earth, I'm willing to give myself entirely to you and to your students. How I wish they see that I am here. And finally, let me end with what St. Jose Maria Escriva taught us. Ours should not just be the piety of children, but also the sure doctrine of theologians. Yes, we have deep love for the Eucharist and the traditions, but we also have to have a deeper doctrinal formation. And as religion teachers, this is our mission. This is our vocation. So once again, thank you very much. I hope you got something out of this session. And how I wish we had more time for me to be able to share a lot about the Eucharist, but that will happen perhaps in our next seminar series. Mr. Rentoy? Thank you very much, Mr. Uh,